Thank you for staying with us on The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. So finally, we have Yam Gold here in the studio. <laughs> he made it. Let us happen to Yam Gold this it, it morning. It just sounded like I was missing, missing person, <laughs> missing adult. Well, I was about to put a flyer somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm not late technically. Pastor not really late for church. You know? Now when he come, I ain't church they start. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so every other thing at Sunday school we they do. <laughs> we will be rehearsing yeah. without you. So, so let's just say that um, the match started, and I'm here. Uh, for the second half so Ooh. you know well so i'll still do my bit as yes. it is you still have a good time you still have a good <laughs> well time. very good morning to you and thanks for uh, staying uh, with us till this moment uh, it's time now to take another uh, very interesting topic is uh, actually our first hot topic for the day and uh, sarah uh, have asked uh, the world bank to suspend loans to nigeria's 36 states and we are glad to have uh, with us here Barista Kolawole Oluwadari, the Deputy Director, Serap. Good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. Let's just get this clear uh, so that it doesn't become like an INEC issue, 36 states and Abuja. You said uh, the loan should not be given to the 36 states. Uh, is Abuja not in the fray? Abuja is part of it. Okay. All right. Now that we know that, you know, so um, how are you trying to, how are you going to prosecute this case? How are you trying to uh, uh, get this done? Thank you very much. Um, this need to not end up as another public interest litigation, uh, like we've always have found time and again. Uh, the advocacy issues that we take up, advocacy on transparency and accountability, become matters of public interest litigation because government and public institutions will not uh, tow the part of the rule of law. And uh, naturally, as law-abiding citizens, we will end up in court. And in this instance, like we've always done, I see no reason why this uh, should become a subject of litigation. It is simple. It is merely a call to the World Bank to perform the statutory obligations to Nigeria as an equal partner in the Committee of Nations. On the other hand, for the state government to also be responsible to obey the rule of law and the, the various duties they owe to uh, Nigerians. I see no reason why this should be a subject of public interest litigation. Is it that the World Bank would say that it doesn't mind how these loans that is granted to Nigerian states have been spent? Or will the governor perhaps say that spending this huge sum of money without being transparent and accountable to the people, sometimes on frivolities, is justifiable? Which I do not see any reason whether in fact or law why it should end up in court. And that is why ultimately conversations like this are important for citizens to own these, as it were, and to be able to compel each of these public institutions, including the World Bank and its affiliates, to do the right thing in these circumstances. But what really informed you you're going to court because of this? Because uh, everybody will, they will tell you, the people who you are trying to stop will tell you that everybody borrows before you could uh, uh, do anything meaningful for your state or your country uh, for that matter. And then was it on the premise that you know that the six states are can sustain themselves, they have the, the right capacity to sustain themselves without having to borrow, because if they cannot do that without borrowing, then it will make no sense. This issue is not about borrowing in the strict sense. It is actually a matter of expenditure, that is the use of public funds, no matter the source of those public funds. But in this instance, for context, we do know that the bulk of the public expenditure to finance the Nigerian budget, including those of the state, primarily comes from borrowing. Uh, FAC allocations are not really being uh, that much and adequate as it were. And even some of the FAC allocations are also sourced from borrowing. And the idea of those states are not doing as well as they should. That now brings us to the issue of the source of those loans and the duty and obligations that the World Bank owes the Nigerian people through the various conventions and treaties that Nigeria has ratified. So, for instance, for a proper context of this conversation. It is not wrong, and we are not saying the Nigerian government or the states in this instance should not borrow. But that borrowing must be done within the context of the rule of law. And there are various laws that guide both the borrowing and the spending. The spending being the most important aspect in this conversation. Because if we spend effectively and efficiently, perhaps there will be no need to borrow. And if we have to borrow, it will be justified. So it gets a point. 
will be the Fiscal Responsibility Act that provides clearly what the means of borrowing should be. In fact, it mandates the federal government and the states to carry out a cost-benefit analysis before any borrowing. And that borrowing should primarily and purposefully be for capital expenditure. But how can you justify the purchase of over 400 million bulletproof cars for the chief of staff in Lagos State in the midst of growing poverty? Justify that. Know it really well that the bulk of those funds are borrowed. And it's justified. And the various expenditures that we've seen across the states, and since I'm indebted to the World Bank and the it, do not justify the reality of the borrowings, particularly in the life of the people. And that's why we're calling on the, on the World Bank as a responsible organization in this instance to ensure that there are transparency and accountability mechanisms. And in this instance, to be a bit uh, to look back at those borrowings that they've done to ensure that those funds are being judiciously spent. With the present facts in the public domain as they are now, those uh, those funds are uh, spent in three in frivolous ways, including for recurrent expenditures, payment of pensions to former governors and their deputy, payment of security votes and whatnot. And the paper expenditure uh, sometimes are overinflated. We've seen in the case of Lagos State and nearly all the states in Nigeria, budget. A civil society organization released a report. You can check it on their open gov website. You would see the details of the budget of each of these states. And you would wonder how these funds could have been allocated to the spent. For instance, uh, in Delta State, there is an allocation for the office of the governor for 22 billion. In Osho State, for instance, with six, six billion uh, to the office of the governor, and then you begin to wonder what are these funds for? And you look at the growing level of poverty in these states, you cannot match the borrowing, even the basis for the borrowing, and development in the states. Which is why the World Bank has to work their life to its responsibilities to ensure that the Nigerian people who will ultimately pay back the funds are not taking for a ride. We've seen Abacha do that. The loot, the, the repatriated funds are still coming in, and we should not allow that to happen again. Okay, so what will happen if the World Bank doesn't respond to this in how you and your organization want it to be? I, I'm really optimistic that the World Bank will eat the call of reason because its own articles of association compels it to do so. The UNCAC Convention, don't forget the World Bank is an agency of the United Nations. The UNCAC, uh, the United Nations Convention Against Corruption, which of course is right by men, they also bind uh, the World Bank to ensure that it is not facilitating and enabling corruption, particularly uh, at the detriment of the Nigerian people. So I still know the why this, uh, the World Bank will not, uh, will not do this. Okay, but the, these um, politicians, they can argue that they're using this capital expenditure for the good of the state. So how do you know that definitely, fine, we're saying the um, 440 million naira bulletproof SUV. However, he has said that uh, it's not for the office. It, it is for the office of the chief of staff and not for the chief of staff himself. So they can actually argue that they are act they're using these monies that they get as loans, fine, I understand that we shouldn't borrow more than, you know, we're spending, right? We should spend, we should find a way to, you know, cut our costs. However, what if they argue with you and maybe we have like a litigation case whereby they're saying they're actually spending judiciously because you can say that this spending is frivolous, but they can also argue that their spending is judicious. Since then, there will be two courts. I will call one the Court of Public Opinion, and then the second will be the Court Primary and Judiciary, as the consumer has given the judiciary that power. Now, we really want to see the governors explain to their citizens some of the ends of costs in the various budgets of the state, which again makes this kind of conversations very important. If people have access to these budgets and scrutinize the various budget lines, these questions will be asked. So, why are these things happening in Lagos State? It is because people can see now that this, our government is borrowing to do this. How can you justify that on the face of poverty? 70% of Nigerians are poor. So how can you justify buying such a jeep bulletproof class and for the office? In the face of great poverty, it's just not justified, particularly for the government that has sworn to lift millions of Nigerians out of poverty. It's not justified. It is really not just when. Perhaps if they can go, and it's to convince Sarah, by the way, you these governors can convince the citizens of their states that this spending is, is, is in their interest and it, it belongs to people. And that is why if we go to court, and don't forget, the court represents the people. That is why the court is called the last of the common man. So on behalf of the people, 
The thought God determines that these spendings are just five and then there's speed. We are bound by the zone of the court uh, in, in any regard. That's the thought of public opinion that I've mentioned earlier. If Nigerians think that this spending is justifiable, then that is it. But it is not. And you can see the reactions to those things that come out from the spendings of the various states. And people are angry. People are calling for, uh, uh, for they're, they're asking questions. And I'm here to see any public officer really effectively justify the spendings. It, it just doesn't add up. How can you spend two billion naira to purchase rechargeable funds to the office of the deputy governor in a city where people are really poor, where there are still bad roads, where all of the schools, most of the schools are not uh, yes, I think, um, okay, okay. You okay, can but go. If eventually we'll have to wrap up here at this point because of uh, time. We would have loved to ask you so many other questions, especially like how is the federal government connected to this case? Because we hear 36 states and the federal government is borrowing even more than the states put together mm -hmm. when they promise that they are not going to borrow and so many other things around it. But we do hope that uh, uh, you get a win for this because. Uh, is the fight for uh, the the common, the common man. man now we don't we are not so sure that the courts are the last hope of the common man but we will still keep fighting and fighting all the time thank you so much uh barrister for coming on the show thank you thank you very much thanks for the opportunity so we're talking with barrister kola wale Oluwadari, deputy director at serap and uh, we are going to take a short break and when we return we'll be looking at cop 28 save it up.